first time in nearly a decade, we have halted the progress of the Iranian nuclear program. After four decades of a bitter standoff, states like these constitute an axis of evil. Iran and the U.S. finally sat down and reached agreement. This deal might be just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. The opportunity to end an unnecessary crisis and open new horizons. A historic moment for some. Today, that diplomacy opened up a new path toward a world that is more secure. A historic mistake for others. This is a bad deal. The Arab and notably Gulf countries have welcomed the nuclear deal. So why do they remain so skeptical of Iran's intentions? They want regional power. They want regional legitimacy. They are getting what they want with the blessing of the United States. As America ignores Israel's warnings and winds back sanctions. In Shishma. The six-month period is the beginning of a new experience for the Iranian nation. Has Obama's diplomacy succeeded where the hoax failed? Tough talk and bluster may be the easy thing to do politically, but it's not the right thing for our security. And is this the start of a new Middle East? I am Marwan Bishara, and this is Empire. It was just a deal to take a break, to push the pause button instead of the red button for six more months of negotiations in the hopes that a comprehensive deal might come. Was it worth all the hoopla and fuss? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Probably so. If the Cold War had been a major motion picture, the contest between the United States and Iran was the made-for-television miniseries. It had all the same elements, but it was smaller in scope, had a lower budget, and a b list cast. There was a ferocious ideological battle. Within the intellectual constellation of the Islamic Revolution, we cannot imagine any relation with America except war. We were in a constant battle with America. We still are, and we will be. With lots of propaganda. Fighting the global arrogance and hostile policies of America is the symbol of our national solidarity. Terrorism, the motive. Islamist fundamentalism, radical extremists incited against Western countries. Provocations. Some 60 Americans, bound and blindfolded, are now beginning their sixth day of captivity inside the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Our young people have taken over this nest of corruption. They've captured the Americans there. America can't do a damn thing about it. Proxy wars with real blood and real dead people. The United States backed Israel. Iran backed Hezbollah. Hezbollah emerged as armed resistance to Israel's invasion of Lebanon. Like a hedge fund for revolution, spotting a hot startup, Iran backed them with money and training from the outset. Washington was horrified by Hezbollah's bomb attacks and outraged by its patrons in Tehran. Nonetheless, comfortable as can be with Israel's three invasions of Lebanon. During the Iraq-Iran war, the United States stayed neutral until it seemed that Iran might win. Then, to make sure that the war ended in a stalemate, it provided Saddam Hussein with weapons, intelligence, and the precursors for chemical weapons. When the United States invaded and occupied Iraq in 2003, Iran was happy to see its nemesis, Saddam, defeated, and no less happy to see the resistance undermine its other nemesis, the United States. The Quds Force, a part of the Iranian government, has provided these uh, sophisticated IEDs that have harmed our troops. The force also supports the militant armed wing of Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in Gaza. And the new phase of intelligence, covert attacks, and counterattacks seem to get underway. The New York Times ran a story about a computer worm called Stuxnet and how it was the Obama administration's key weapon in a prolonged cyber attack on Iran's nuclear weapons program. With the U.S. and Iran accusing each other of carrying out terrible assassinations and bombings to undermine each other in their shadow combat. Washington's favorite euphemism for the threat of war is... We, the United States, have all options on the table. No option is ever off the table. All options. On the table. 
Indeed, politicians in the West had been saying that sanctions had not stopped Iran's nuclear program. Iranians made the same claim. Sanctions, humiliation and discrimination will in no way work. And hence sanctions too will be ineffective. That negotiations won't work. For 10 years, uh, Iran has used the negotiations to buy time, to gain legitimacy, uh, and to continue its work on its program. The Iranians had to be stopped before they got nuclear weapons, and ultimately, there was only one way to do it. That old Beach Boy song, Bomb Iran. <laughs> So why the sudden turnaround? And why did it happen now? There was an official explanation. The sanctions have had a substantial impact on the Iranian economy. It does and appear that, that these sanctions yeah. have worked, and that, that brought them to the table. The sanctions are, I believe, what has brought Iran to the table to negotiate in the first place. It sounded simple, reasonable, and convincing like a bumper sticker. So we decided to look a little deeper. We have to remember that as the, we have ramped up sanctions on the Iranian government, especially over the past three years, they have ramped up the technical aspects of their nuclear program. If you were to chart it out, it shows very clearly that as sanctions have increased, so too have the technical aspects of Iran's nuclear program. You could just as easily say uh, that 19,000 centrifuges brought the Americans to the table. Actually, after 9-11, there was an outpouring of sympathy for America in Iran. I stand before you to once again express my deepest sympathy with the families of the victims. Also at that moment in time, the United States and Iran had an enemy in common, the Taliban in Afghanistan. The Bush administration's response was... Axis of evil. Yet in 2003, Iran still made a back-channel approach to the United States through the Swiss ambassador. The Iranians came forward with a grand bargain proposal to discuss all of the outstanding issues that we say that we don't like about the Iranians. Terrorism, Hamas, Hezbollah, the nuclear program, regional security issues, energy security issues, everything under the sun. Uh, and the Bush administration walked away from that. That deal was as good as anything that is on the table now. What happened back then? What's changed now? We spoke to a man who was there. Ambassador, welcome to the Empire. And thank you for having us here. A, an interim deal has been signed between Iran and the six leading world powers. There's a lot of reference that this could have been done while you were involved in those negotiations back in 2003 to 2005. Why did it, why did it succeed this time? U.S. position changed from no enrichment to no nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. This is a huge shift. Big difference between no enrichment and no nuclear bomb. But now you're saying that you have a right to enrich. They're saying you don't have a right to enrich. There is no right to enrich. We do not recognize a right to enrich. Americans, they have never recognized the rights of any country for enrichment publicly and officially. But practically, they have accepted enrichment programs in different countries like Germany, Netherlands. The rights already is given by NPT. Iran is not asking the rights. Iran is asking for respecting the rights. And who's, so who's the winners? Who are the losers out of this deal? I think both of them are winners. Okay. And that happened because the sanctions worked? No. Sanctions was completely counterproductive. I think the sanction worked, Ambassador. Look, sanctions harmed Iran, no doubt about it. Harmed Iranian economy extensively, no doubt about it. So then the sanctions worked. Hold on. But if the objective of sanctions was to contain Iranian nuclear program, look at the result. Before sanctions, Iran had 3,000 centrifuges. After sanctions, now Iran has 19,000 centrifuges. But Iran was forced to come to the table. No. Before sanctions, Iran had a few hundred kilograms of enriched uranium stockpile. Now Iran has 8,000 kilograms. Before sanctions, Iran was enriching below 5%. After sanctions, enriching at 20%. Before sanction, Iran was enriching with one generation of centrifuges. Now Iran is enriching with different sophisticated generation of centrifuges. Therefore, sanctions 
pushed more sanctions, more enrichment in Iran. This was the result. So what happens now? You seem to be writing a lot about how Iran now can be very useful to the United States. I believe Iran, whether they want it or not, whether they like it or not, the U.S., the West, Iran is part of a, 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 a big player on peace and stability in the Middle East. We have crisis in Afghanistan. But you're proposing that it's become part of a Pax Americana in the region. That's what you're proposing. No. No, no. You want to help them in Afghanistan. You want to help them in Syria. It is you not want to the help case. them in the Gulf. It is not the case. I believe Americans are, are changing their policy in the Middle East. And you think they'll become more dependent on Iran? No. I think Americans will not be dependent on any country. As long as there is less hostilities between Iran and the U.S., there would be less problem for the region. There would be better for peace, security, stability. But you're in the trigger region. happy to cooperate with them in places like Syria, like the Gulf, like Iraq, Iran, like Afghanistan. Iran is prepared to cooperate not only with the U.S. Iran proposed to establish a regional cooperation: Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. This was Iranian proposal. But so now Washington is no longer the great Satan that needs to be no, defeated. No, no. The, 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 uh, are, are we moving towards cooperation? And we are moving toward detente. Still, it is too soon to say, even rapprochement. This is the beginning of detente between Iran and the US. And you think in six months they will reach a final agreement? I'm optimistic. Ambassador Barbara, welcome to Empire. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, so, an interim deal has been signed, uh, regardless of for the time being, whether it is a breakthrough or a mistake, as it's been called, it has been referred to as historic. There have been a lot of false dawns, a lot of false starts that never led anywhere, and they never led anywhere because of the domestic politics on the two sides. Meaning? There are a lot of people in this country, in the United States, who are still uh, very angry about the hostage crisis and the humiliation that it entailed. A humiliation politically, humiliation militarily with Desert One, the failure of the rescue operation, it cost Jimmy Carter his presidency. I don't think anybody would dispute that. What I've heard from the Iranians is that the same thing that was offered in 2003 under uh, Khatimi, when Rouhani was involved, is offered today, except then it wasn't, it wasn't accepted by Washington, which meant 10 years of wasting time. I think there's been an awful lot of wasted time. And the issue comes down to this. Uh, does Iran have the right to a some measure of control over the nuclear fuel cycle and to a, a nuclear program of some sort. Um, and apparently we've now agreed finally that it does. Uh, so that is, in that, that sense... It has the right or it, it will de facto enrich? That, nobody's talking about who has the right. Okay. But de facto, we've acknowledged that Iran will do this. So I think that is a distinction without a difference. And you think that's what made the deal a deal? This time it's around? not a deal yet. Um, Interim an interim arrangement, which could lead to a deal. However, as you can see, if you read the press, uh, there are a lot of people out there who are still reaching for what I think is impossible, namely a complete rollback and dismantling of the Iranian And who program. are these people, Ambassador? Uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, for one, um, and his flax uh, for many others. This is a bad deal, a very, very bad deal. There have been a number of prominent commentators uh, in the United States uh, and Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel who have compared the interim nuclear deal with Iran to the Munich Agreement in 1938 between the British and French and Adolf Hitler. This is a sham from beginning to end. It's the worst deal since Munich. I think it's a very bad analogy. Is it, is it me or do the president's comments sound eerily similar to what Neville Chamberlain said back in 1938? Prime Minister Chamberlain would have been proud. So Benjamin Netanyahu compared Yitzhak Rabin to Neville Chamberlain in Munich uh, for signing the Oslo Accords in 1993. Newt Gingrich compared Ronald Reagan to Neville Chamberlain in Munich for meeting Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985. And so this is a, an analogy that gets trotted out a tremendous amount by people on the American and Israeli right. But within a month, Netanyahu had softened his stance. So while Israel is prepared to do what is necessary to defend itself, a diplomatic solution is better than a military option. I think, I think the opposition to this deal is broader than that, with all due respect. Um, 
there are a lot of people who simply don't want to see uh, a regime like Iran's having this large a nuclear infrastructure. And you said it was the same deal as 2003. That's not the case. In 2003, Iran had a few hundred centrifuges, right. a pilot program. Now it's got uh, 19,000 centrifuges. It's got advanced centrifuges. It has a, a facility that's built inside a mountain. It has a heavy water reactor, sure. which is under construction. So, I mean, the deal now, you know, the West is disadvantaged. Again, I blame the George W. Bush administration. He lost the opportunity of engaging with Iran after 9-11, which was a a really huge mistake. If there's a crisis of some sort and the Iranians decide to withdraw from the NPT and kick out the inspectors, it's a lot scarier if they have 19,000 yeah, you know, The is, ability to break out is much, much easier. I think one study from the Brookings Institution here in Washington outlined that the best possible chance to attack Iran is when, attack, when Iran actually uh, comes back on its signed agreement with all six leading I, world powers. I disagree. I think we, we lost that opportunity a long time ago. It's too late to use the military option against Iran. They know too much, they have too much. The military option is extraordinarily unattractive and perhaps unworkable. But, but you said a lot close. of people are out there are against no, it. No, I'm thinking of people in Congress who, who have to answer not just to AIPAC, but also to Christian fundamentalist groups who are very concerned about Israeli security and who see Iran still as a threat to Israel, who remember Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and wipe Israel off the map and Holocaust and denial. Some, and some in the uh, military industrial complex, as Eisenhower would have called it. I don't know. Actually, I think in, if you look at the military establishment and the intelligence establishment in our country, quite similar to Israel, there are opposed to military action. And the American people, we learned from the debate over Syria intervention, I mean, they would not even support a few punitive pinpick, uh, pinprick strikes against Syria. So this country is not in a warlike mood. Ambassador, is there a shift in paradigm in, in terms of American foreign policy in the region? I think you'd have to conclude that that, that is what is happening. Um, I don't think it's a deliberate strategic design. I think it's a response to events uh, and trends. Um, to but take, didn't take Obama the, say that in 2008, that he wants to talk to Iran, that he thinks it's yes. a diplomatic solution? Yes, yes, he did. So there um, is a vision behind um, this. Yes. There was a vision. Uh, that vision got quite eclipsed in the first term uh, when he was humiliated by Mr. Netanyahu on the settlement expansion issue. Uh, and Israel uh, spent most of the time beating the war drums uh, for an attack on Iran. To Mr. Obama's credit, he did not respond to that signal. It helps a great deal that the Iranians had an election this uh, past summer uh, that was won by somebody who was presentable, who was a presentable member but, of the but establishment. There is, there is more going on in the region than, than the Iranian change of regime, which is sure. important. Um, Egypt has undergone two coups. Um, let's be plain about what they are. And it is under a military dictatorship. U.S.-Egyptian relations are quite strained as a result. U.S. relations with Saudi Arabia are strained over that issue because of the Saudi distaste for our effort to uh, uh, cozy up to the Muslim Brotherhood government of Mr. Morsi. Um, U.S.-Saudi relations have had a break over Syria. The Saudis are, have now announced that they're not going to follow American direction anymore in Syria but pursue their own interests, uh, which suggests that the paradigm there has changed. Is the diminished influence a result of the policy of the Obama administration, or is it a result of the fiascos of the Bush administration? Okay. And what Obama is doing is salvaging the failures in Iraq, Afghanistan, and, so on, and Iran. I would say it's mostly the Bush administration's colossal errors. Yeah. Um, that is the, the absurd uh, uh, invasion of Iraq, the decision to turn Afghanistan into a pacification campaign rather than a punitive yeah. raid. So what is wrong with? Uh, downsizing military involvement in the Middle East. I mean, why is that a bad thing for America or for the region? I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's only a bad thing if our allies feel insecure and feel they need to hedge and that they feel that they don't need to listen but to the United about, isn't, States but uh, isn't it as time much as they for used the to. But isn't it time for the allies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, to find some regional solution for the regional problems instead of depending on the United States? Military power is vastly overrated in terms of what, what it can accomplish. And no one overrates it more than Americans. Um, economic power, political influence, friendship, ties of, 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 a, of you know, wasta, in the, to use the Arabic term. These things are all terribly important. The Iranians I spoke to say we can be helpful, helpful, intermediary in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gulf security, 
they're actually offering their services to the. I mean, I why is that, that a problem? I would, I would take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Of course, okay. a lot of it. <laughs> but no, yes. absolutely, they can. They do have influence in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Syria, and in Lebanon, and in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And if they choose to play a constructive role, you know, it will be great. But that will diminish the influence of the Arabs in all this sphere. I, I would say you're describing a Saudi nightmare in which the United States recognizes, acknowledges, and works with Iran to solve the problems of the region, i.e., Iran is the top dog. Can I ask you a question, Chaz? Is there any way that one could possibly imagine Saudi Arabia and Iran actually working together? I mean, they do have diplomatic relations. Iranian leaders have gone oh, to, sure. to Saudi Arabia and had discussions, and they've even negotiated, Rouhani negotiated a security so, agreement with the Saudis one of in the, the late 90s. You, you can ignore that, that Chaz. I asked the question. So. Okay. <laughs> no, but I mean... No, I mean, she's, that's a great question. Why go, not? Well, please, why not? Then you should have asked. Why, go not? Ahead. why not? The outside... The presence of outside powers like the United States is a complication. Mm -hmm. uh, each of them is, in effect, trying to manipulate Washington rather than deal with each other about their problems. Um, as Washington's influence recedes, probably the likelihood that they will have to find a way to work with each other will go up. The same thing for Israel and its Arab neighbors. Exactly. Israel has essentially negotiated with the United States, not with the Arabs. Uh, it might actually have to negotiate with the Arabs at some point. That wouldn't be a bad idea. So here we have a state that is the only nuclear power in the Middle East that is worried about Iran, who is committed not to be a nuclear power. There are many Israelis who genuinely believe, I think without much foundation, but they do believe that Iran might, might attack them with nuclear weapons to annihilate them. Uh, and uh, there are, if they were to... Um, uh, acquiesce in this, in their view, they would be losing clout. Yeah, I think they're I'm, more I'm, concerned about the clout it would give anti-Israel forces like Hezbollah. I think that's a bigger concern, frankly. Speaking of Israel, it seems to be, speaking of, of its nuclear uh, program, is not permitted in Washington. De facto, no one speaks about it. Very. Zinko, this fellow in foreign policy, says it's the unspoken rule in Washington I, I, that you don't mention I Israel agree, nuclear I power. agree that it's a taboo here. And if you do raise the question in a serious discussion of proliferation policy, well, what about the Israeli problem? Uh, they say, well, that's off the table. We're no, not dealing well, with that. You don't think that's inadequate? I, I, I raise it. I, in fact, I've, I've said and written that Israel is the existential threat to Iran, not the other way around, because the Israelis have 100 nuclear weapons, you know? It, it's, but you're it, not soliciting funds for, no, I'm not for soliciting, a political campaign, No, I'm not soliciting you? funds for a political campaign. Obviously, the question of what happens to Israel's nukes is tied up with whether Israel is ever accepted in the region, whether there's ever a, a complete and comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace agreement. The Israelis are not going to give up their nuclear weapons until that happens. And they say, you know, we are a better regime than the crazy Iranians. Now, that's a harder argument to make now that you have Hassan Rouhani and not Mahmoud Ahmadinejad as the the public face of the Iranian regime. It's also hard to make after Gaza and Lebanon. Ambassador Barbara, thank you for joining Empire. And I'll be back after a news break. What is it that they want? They want regional power. They want regional legitimacy. Of course, Iran does not need the United States now to get this kind of you know, acknowledgement about its, its role. But the meaning now that the United States, after 30, 30 years of you know, crisis with the United States, they are getting what they want with the blessing of the United States. Iran must not get a nuclear weapon. America will do what we must to prevent a nuclear armed Iran. We are not going to allow Iran to acquire a nuclear weapon. We will not allow Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. Period. <laughs> But Iran kept pushing forward with its nuclear program, a game of high noon. Just before the first shot was fired, someone said, pause, why don't we put it on hold for six months and see if we can make a deal? At least uh, for the time being, the worst scenario is off the table and peace scenario is on the table. This thing is gonna come out on their side. It's a huge victory for Iran. If you want to uh, differentiate between uh, 
who is the winner and who is the loser, I can say that those who were in favor of war uh, are losers and those who were in favor of uh, peace in the region are winners. After 30 years, the politics of the Islamic Republic remains opaque and bewildering to the outside world. Is it a totalitarian theocracy? A lot of people in Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway, say that it's one man, one vote, and that man is the supreme leader. I think we found out in June of 2013 in their election that that's false. Iran does, in fact, have politics. Or is the key word republic? Iran is, I would say, the land of contradictions and contrasts. If you compare Iran to other countries in the region that also have authoritarian regimes, the Iranian parliament is a relatively, quote unquote, free parliament. They discuss all sorts of issues. I mean, you should try and find one other country in the region where the parliament rejects a nominee for a cabinet, not once, not twice, but three times. The age of negotiation was ushered in by the election of a new president. How much of a change does he represent? When Mr. Rouhani ran for president, but he also in promised the Iranian people that he would make sure that there is going to be a citizen's rights charter and also that security institutions would not uh, be so powerful and would not interfere in people's daily life. I am not going to say that he's a Democrat, and I'm not going to say that you know he's a reformer in the same vein as former President Khatami, for example. But I think the positions that he's staked out on foreign and domestic policy so far are markedly different from his predecessor, night and day, on a lot of core important issues. Since Mr. Rouhani became president, I mean, on the average, and uh, this is a figure that um, human rights organizations have put out, on the average, two people a day have been executed in Iran for whatever reason. Um, a number of political prisoners were free, but other political activists, civil rights activists, are being arrested, bloggers, journalists. There have been reformers before, like Hossein Mousavi. Many people believe Ahmadinejad stole the 2009 presidential elections from him. Mousavi remains under house arrest. As for Mohammed Khatimi, the reformist president from 1997 to 2005. Where is Mr. Khatami now? Mr. Khatami is not allowed to leave the country now. He has faded from the political sphere of the country for four years, and he will continue to fade. All of Mr. Khatami's actions in the political arena of Iran are reduced to watching plays and going to music events. Is Khamenei the supreme leader solidly on board? Yes, I am sure that uh, President Rouhani uh, has uh, full support of the leader. If he didn't have such a support, uh, he would have never been able uh, to enter uh, such an intense negotiation with the P5 plus one. Uh, and uh, um, he also has uh, the support of all sides inside Iran. My belief is that the leadership of the Islamic Republic opened the way for negotiations to leave a historical proof behind for our generation and the future generations. He gave this opportunity to the reformists, moderates and supporters of the West in Iran to move forward and see that all your assumptions and ideas are wrong. I think the hardliners are sitting and waiting, you know, to see where these negotiations will go wrong. If the second phase of the negotiation is not up to what the Iranians expect it to be, then, and if the Supreme Leader shows his doubt about the end game, then the hardliner will come back. If negotiations are successful and those who favor peace continue to be the winners, 
what can we expect the effects to be on the region? We went to the Gulf to gauge the mood there and to speak with Marwan Kabalan, Mahjoub Zwiri, and Hamid Tabashi. Mahjoub, Marwan, Hamid, welcome to Empire. We've just come back from Washington and it seems the mood is pretty cautiously optimistic. Yeah, the Iran is cautiously pessimistic, which makes it again 50-50 the other way. But that conservative wing, is it going to go forward? They will be monitoring the situation and they will, in, in, in some stage they will be intervening and they will be used by the establishment to get more from the United States. Both have interests. Iran has things to offer to the United States, especially in the last remaining uh, two years of Obama administration, mm -hmm. which Obama cannot afford not to ask. But this is the reason they, that when you, say they, when you say Iran, you're still speaking about it in terms of a consensus of sort within Iran. Dialectic, uh, Marwan, is not a consensus. It's dialectic that is happening, and and in my opinion, Khamenei is in charge of generating that uh, dialectic. That is the the reformist um, uh, move by Rouhani and uh, uh, Zarif, but yet he also unleashes the conservative voices. I think, yes, I mean, all, um, uh, um, you know, Khamenei is in charge. Basically, he's trying to benefit from the conservative, the revolutionary regard to intervene uh, in, um, in the minute where he sees there's something going wrong and, and keeps the president, in a way, cautious about what he's doing and he's monitored as well. Khamenei is trying to um, over, overview everything and intervene whenever he sees that intervention is needed. But it seems to me that Rouhani could deliver the Americans on some sort of a deal, but it doesn't mean that Khamenei is going to respect it or honor it in the long term. Well, I, I feel like uh, in Iran there is, uh, especially now, there is this uh, the bad cop, good cop, uh, kid cop, uh, good cop uh, game between, uh, I mean, the different uh, centers of powers inside the system. But at the end of the day, I, I mean, I feel like, I mean, the, the, the rapprochement with the United States is something irreversible. And I think the will is there. I mean, that is my, that is my hunch. The will is there. Uh, and uh, everybody has decided that it may, perhaps it's time actually to seal off, I mean, this uh, uh, um, enmity uh, of the past uh, three decades. And uh, uh, the United States uh, has uh, been hurting Iran uh, uh, a lot, actually, especially because of the economic sanctions. But do, you, but, but do you actually think after 35 years of shouting death to America, suddenly it's going to be Viva America? Uh, Khamenei would allow to death to America to continue, but also Rouhani to continue to negotiate. And the, the central dialectical force is to proceed cautiously and derive a hard bargain for every inch that they give, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq or in Afghanistan or wherever, they gain something. What is it that they want? They want regional power. They want regional legitimacy. Who will benefit? It's the regime. The regime has moved from that perception of being threatened by regime change now to speak about, you know, we are surviving. We are now sitting with the Americans. We speak about every small details, you know, and we are moving to be, to get more regionally. We played everywhere without, you know, the blessing of the United States. But the meaning now that the United States, after 30, 30 years of you know, crisis with the United States, they are getting what they want with the blessing of the United States. You don't think they're going to need an enemy? This might lead to sectarian conflict of sort mm -hmm. in the of region. Mm -hmm. Of course. I think this is a very risky, uh, this is a very risky game, even for the Iranians. I think some in Iran, they are very much aware of the fact that if we go ahead with this game, the sectarian, the Sunni against Shia, uh, I think, I think uh, some, some in Iran actually are very concerned about this. They don't want to play it. I mean, that is my hunch. In they Iran? In Iran, yeah. The Gulf Cooperation Council has been so skeptical. On the one hand, they welcome the agreement, but on the other hand, they're quite worried about a hegemon Iran. The Iranian nuclear program has always been uh, a challenge for the Israelis, but it shouldn't be seen as such for the Arabs. And what should the Arabs be really concerned about is Iran's conventional uh, 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 power. Uh, why? Because the nuclear weapons are not to be used. I mean, they are not yeah. going to be used anyway. Now, with this deal now taking place suddenly, without being consulted, with, and with the uh, you know efforts by one of Arab states like GC, uh, Oman, of course there will be more you know concern about it because basically there is sort of belief that the price will be paid by Arabs, but by others. Iranian nuclear program was always been the bargaining chip that the Iranians have been using actually in order to have uh, the sort of deal with not only with the Americans but in, in, in fact with the, with the, with the inter international community because you are having here 
the, the, the biggest powers of the world actually uh, talking to the in order the, to do to what the, to the, in order to come to approve what the Iranians have been actually building over the past 10 years since the invasion of Afghanistan and the invasion of Iraq right. that is building uh, a hegemonic uh, regional power in the region but did Hamid did 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 Iran build a hegemonic power or were a series of American failures in Afghanistan Iraq Bravo. and so on Bravo. you see over the last 30 years Every place that U.S. and Israel has been dropping bombs, Iranians have been building bridges, Absolutely. have been building houses Correct. in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Their soft power comes precisely because they have been working from ground up. So the hegemony is not a kind of a political hegemony that with a bomb can be destroyed. But, I, mean, I mean, things have changed, in fact, especially after the Syrian revolution, because here, actually, Iran lost most of its this soft power. And you think Syria exposed Iran, weakened Iran? I think so, yes, yeah. very much. So, I, mean, I think yeah, I mean, that was correct. I mean, Rastanjani said it in public that, you know, that look what Bashar is doing, killing his people. Um, I think um, the perception of Iran has influenced badly by its position towards Syria, of course, in the Arab world. But this is not was the, the first event. The first event was what happened in Iran in summer 2009, when the government, you know, faced its people with a security hand and, and killing people in the street because of they were demonstrating against the result of the elections. The reason that you have divisions in Iran, you have divisions in the Arab world, you have divisions in Washington, is that we are at the cusp of a major foreign policy change. Iran has played its card so well that can begin to change the, the geopolitics of the region in a way to its own benefit, but also to change the thinking in the Arab world that they should not put all their security eggs in the basket of the United States, but begin to think in terms of their, in their own self-interest in a manner that now includes the Iranian interests. It seems that in the region there is fear that America is shifting its clientele between Israel, Saudi Arabia, to perhaps Iran, Turkey, and, and re-outsourcing its power in the region. I think, Marwan, right now we have to think in terms of the last two years of Obama administration, the fact that he as a president is thinking of his legacy, and if as little as even having a charge d'affaires in Tehran would have more significance in terms of his legacy uh, for his... Uh, what about Khamenei's legacy? Is he looking for that kind of legacy? His legacy would be to continue the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic in the larger global context. Iran has not had a chance, a similar chance, since the early Iranian revolution of 1977-79 to be a legitimate regional power. Islamic Republic over the last 33 years has either generated crisis or taken advantage of a crisis. Yes. It's a crisis-ridden uh, uh, regime. Uh, the American hostage crisis of 1979-1980, uh, Iran-Iraq war of 1980-1988, Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon in 1982 uh, that then, then started the Iranian involvement uh, in the region. One crisis after uh, another. This has been part of the DNA of political culture. It is a time to put those crises uh, behind and begin to take advantage of all of those interests and cultivations and soft power that it has cultivated over the last 30 years to redefine the Iranian Islamic Republic's political culture in a more permanent and enduring way. All of that is going to translate itself first and foremost in Syria, in, I, I, where, I, I, where Geneva too, presumably, is coming up. Well, here you actually, think the Iranians will be tested on that and how will they fare? I think that is going to be the first test for the Iranians, in fact, in terms of how they are willing actually to cooperate with the Americans in order to solve regional problems. But that's what the Saudis want. The Saudis yeah. want, yeah. and the rest of the Gulf countries, yeah. they want proof that this intention is going to be met with words. And the, that's what the Saudis think, Mahjoub, mm. like the rest of the Arab Gulf countries. They mm. want these words to be met by deeds from Tehran. Look, Iran um, um, effort to sign this, uh, this deal quickly is to make sure that they have a stronger presence in Geneva too. And that, that presence does not mean they want to direct everything. Here we have Iran with influence in Iraq, yeah. Iran with future influence in Syria, Iran with influence in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And of course, if the Americans could have it their way, there will be some sort of arrangement with Iran in Afghanistan. That seems to be like Iran is going to be benefiting greatly. 
you know, let, let's not forget also that, you know, Turkey, is, uh, Iran is not a superpower who can manage all these, you know, these are files. You need a country which has a lot of energy politically and financially. And Iran with the political, with the sanction, Iran cannot manage that financially. So this is the reason why they went and they want to deal with the United States. Let's forget another point, Marwan, here, was basically, uh, um, Iran is worried, of, um, you know, of, of Turkish role as well in the region, and they are, you know, they they see Turkey a real competent in the region, and they see it, you know, present Sunni Islam as it's trying to be present itself as uh, protecting Sunni Islam. So they have to be more, you know, realistic and keep in mind the role of Turkey as well in the region, not to confront Turkey. Well, they certainly have been pragmatist and realist, haven't they? Well, the they Iranians. are actually. I mean, I, 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 my hunch is that the Iranians are very good player, but they don't know how to score, to be honest. At the end of the day. <laughs> Why? Because, look, I mean, they have been trying over the past 10 years, actually, to build regional influence. But if, look, for example, now at Iraq, uh, uh, it's true that they are having their uh, allies in power in Iraq, but Iraq is not stable. And it's, I mean, there's a the big probability of having a civil war back in Iraq. In Syria, three years ago, the whole Syria was theirs, uh, was an Iranian like, uh, like, uh, province. Like, uh, like province. But today, I mean, just... <laughs> A portion of Syria is an Iranian, uh, an Iranian province. Yeah. So I think the Iranians here are trying to, they have to be quick actually in order to cash in now, because if they don't cash in now, especially in Syria, they might not even have what they have now I in think, the future. I think that Marwan just used a magnificent metaphor that is Iranian play well, but they don't score. You know, historically we say that Iranians are good wrestlers, but not yes. good soccer uh, uh, yeah. players. <laughs> <laughs> that means that, in fact, they have to learn to begin to play soccer. They have to bring the Arabs on board. They have to uh, uh, start bringing the Turks on board and the Afghans on board. If singularly, if one-to-one -one between Iran and U.S. or Iran and Israel, Iran will lose, no matter how much their but soft But that power. does require, then, a different mindset in Iran than the one that calls for death to America and skepticism of the Arabs and so on and so forth. That this will require a new type of Marwan, leadership. I have absolutely no doubt overnight that kind of rhetoric will change without because iran has common interests with the united states in every one of these uh, regions so far as there is they, they 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 drive a hard bargain for every chip that they gave they want to uh, against but you don't think that there is what you called earlier a deep state don't you don't think that there is a deep state in iran that benefits from the tensions with the united states absolutely benefits so from the that's why they crisis in the rest that, of the region. That's why they will drive a hard bargain in a way that that in, uh, deep state will stay in, uh, uh, untouched. You yes. mean they will have their cake but, and eat it but too? Their, but their economic interests, their political interests, the regional geopolitical interests will be reconfigured. They will not give an inch. The Pastoran has the complete economy under yeah. control. Yeah. By one, the way, one, back, one, back to your uh, thing about uh, freezing the nuclear program back in 2004. What they got in return for that was membership in the World Trade Organization. Exactly. Organizations. Exactly. exactly. So, are we witnessing now once again an Iran that wants to be part of that Western world order? In my opinion, is more regional, Marwan, than, than Western. And mm -hmm. also keep in mind, all of these concessions, enrichment under nine percent, only up to fifty percent, NPT regulations, etc. All it means. NPT regulation plus the uh, additional protocols, all it means Iran is weaponizable anywhere between six months to nine months. Because the infrastructure... So is now there. it's a nuclear state. This has state. always been the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, remember a few years ago, Iran will be just six months, one exactly. year from yes, exactly. acquiring a yeah. nuclear uh, weapon. But that never uh, actually uh, yeah. uh, happened. And I think this is why Iran has always been using this nuclear program as a bargaining chip. They have never been actually serious about having a nuclear weapon because they very think good, that uh, they, the price might be, I mean, uh, too heavy uh, uh, to take if exactly. they produce a nuclear weapon. It's important to remember that, you know, regime is renewing its legitimacy by having this kind of deal done. Basically, the regime was facing a problem outside the country because of its, you know, images being influenced badly and internally a lot of criticism because of the impact of the um, economic sanctions. Uh, sanctions. So basically now the regime goes back to the, its own people by saying, look, I'm giving these concessions because I am worried about the impact of the sanction and I want these sanctions to be removed. For that reason, I am engaged with the discussion with the United States. And this is something I think will be looked at seriously inside Iran. A stagnated regime that is about to renew itself? 
feasible? I think, I think here actually where the regime might be thinking of renewing its uh, legitimacy by redefining Iran's regional role. Very good. By That's actually right. redefining good. Yes. The, the, the relationship with the United States. With and, the, and, and the Arab world. I think so. I mean, this but is will it then important. be, there will no more exporting revolution no more a question of uh, Shiism, but more about this Iranian is where, nationalism. Actually, this is where we should see that actually when start to, the Americans and the Iranians start talking about Syria and start talking about other regional issues. Here is the test. So let's just end with some kind of a, a preview of, of the future. Let's say there is a deal signed, as you seem to think it will be <coughs> six months from now. How will this, what will this diplomacy lead to, say, a couple of years from now, Hamid? There's an Afghanistan deadline. There is a Syrian deadline. There's a peace process, presumably, that's going on. What will Iran look like in, in this uh, configuration? For the next two to three years, uh, what is, has remained of, uh, there are two clocks uh, ticking. One is Obama's clock, one is Rouhani's clock. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obama's clock is taking faster than Rouhani's uh, uh, clock. And Khamenei's clock as well? No, oh. I mean, he, Khamenei's clock is eternity. <laughs> Just goes Unless forever. God decides. Yeah. And within, so as a result, I think uh, uh, strategically, pragmatically, Obama's clock is more critical because he wants to get something done. And what he wants to do is uh, uh, even more easing of the sanctions, lifting of the military uh, struck option of off the, on the table, off the table, etc. I think, uh, you know, Iran, Iran will, will try in the next two, three years to manage all of these files, those issues, Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Syria. Uh, the serious, the serious um, test is Syria. Whether how Iran will perform, well, you know how Iran will, you know what are the suggestions Iran will put, whether Iran will present actually would have, you know, will be there or not, you know how, you know whether they will put issues like what they have done in Iraq, basically suggesting some sectarian issues and or, or, or division within the, you know uh, within the Syrian, uh, you know demographic map. I think these are one of one of the important tests will tell us about the performance of Iran. But I believe that Iran will be more focused internally because they want to get their economy a little bit stand, you know. On that sobering note, gentlemen, I will be back with a final thought. Contrary to conventional wisdom, the disagreement in America over Iran is not between Israel's supporters and its opponents. There are two influential camps in the United States, one that supports Israel, the other thinks like Israel. A decade ago, I wrote about this latter camp by talking about the Israelization of American foreign policy under George W. Bush. You see, when the world's sole superpower acts like its gun-ho client, well, you can kiss the Middle East goodbye. What President Obama is trying to do is de-Israelize American foreign policy by decoupling the American and the Israeli mindsets. Is it ideal? Absolutely not. Is this the best way forward? Most likely. Better the alternative? Yes. Is it imperial? Of course. But it's not Israeli. And that's the way it goes. Well, write to me with your suggestions and thoughts. Until next time.